Welcome to another episode of Brain Scratch. I'm John Lorden. Thank you so much for joining me here as we look into another unsolved mystery together. It was 2008. I was working an IT job somewhere, and I remember hearing about a tragic multiple homicide that happened at a women's clothing store. Do you remember the Lane Bryant murders? It's been 15 years, and they're still unsolved. Let's look into it today and see what we can piece together in terms of this story. Now, law enforcement has been pretty tight-lipped on some of the details, but I've reached back to old newspaper articles, uh, old web sources, and kind of the current stuff that is kicked out for the 15th anniversary. We're going to try to get some type of comprehensive picture of what is known about this case and hopefully help re-raise exposure, maybe get someone to pick up the phone and... uh, bring an answer to these numerous families that are affected by this. But this starts with a quick stop at Wikipedia so we can learn where this is taking place. This is in Tinley Park, Illinois. Tinley Park is a village in Cook County, Illinois, United States, with a small portion of it in Will County. The village is a suburb of Chicago. Per the 2020 census, the population was 55,971. It is one of the fastest growing suburbs southwest of Chicago. In 2009, Business Week named Tinley as the best place in America to raise a family. Very curious that they would win that a year after this tragedy, but obviously a very nice place to live. And from what I can see, law enforcement has been extremely committed to trying to push this case forward. This is not a case that has ever gone cold by what I can see. It has basically been an active investigation for the past 15 years. And this is a Google Street View from back in 2012. It's the earliest that they have for this area, but this empty storefront that you can see here, this is where the Lane Bryant store was. Carrie Ann Hudek Quizo, age 33. She was a wife, a daughter, a sister, an aunt, and a niece. She was an outgoing, outspoken woman who lived every day with a palpable joy. From the first time I met her, it was her smile that captivated me, said her husband, Tony. The two married in June of 2006. That was the happiest day of my life, he said. And if his wedding day was the best day of his life, Saturday was the worst. It's just surreal, he said. It's like living a bad dream. He said he was waiting for Comcast to install cable and phone service at his home while his wife picked up some presents to bring to her cousin's daughter's birthday party. She called and let him know that she was heading to the bank and then into Lane Bryant to buy a shawl for their big day out in the city. His next call came from a co-worker telling him about the shooting. I was trying to call her and call her and call her, and she wasn't answering her phone, her husband said. She made me want to be a better person. I'm just lost. Connie R. Wolfolk. Connie Wolfolk was looking forward to a fun Saturday night. The devoted single mother had scheduled a manicure and pedicure and had paid a visit to Lane Bryant looking for an outfit to wear for her girls' night out later in the evening. She never made it out. Enewspf.com would continue. Connie Wolfolk, a former employee with the village of Park Forest, was one of five women murdered at the Lane Bryant clothing store Saturday morning in Tinley Park. She leaves behind two sons, one a junior in high school and the other only in fourth grade. She was only 37 years old. Jennifer Bishop, who goes by Jenny, only 34 years old, her life taken away in this tragedy. Surviving her are her husband, Brian, Three children who at the time were seven, five, and six months. Jenny was a 1992 Marion High School graduate where she was known for her basketball and softball skills. She graduated from Indiana University with a Bachelor of Science in Nursing in 1996. She had been employed by Memorial Hospital since 1995, her most recent assignment in the ICU. Her fellow nurses describe her as a compassionate, caring, knowledgeable, and efficient nurse. She had recently been promoted to charge nurse. She was a loving, caring wife, mother, sister, and daughter, and she brought joy to her children and her family. Unfortunately, there's not a ton of information about Sarah Zavransky. She was only 22 years old, barely getting started in life. Also a daughter, a sister, a soulmate, a granddaughter, and a niece. 
as well as a cousin and friend to many. And what's really tragic about this is everyone that we've spoken about up to this point, they were customers. They were just customers. Now we talk about the employee, the manager for that store that was working there, Rhoda C. Hamilton McFarland. And from my point of view, this woman is a hero in more ways than one. First of all, she's a U.S. Air Force veteran. Uh, she also served as, as an associate pastor at Embassy Christian Center. She was managing the Lane Bryant store in Tinley Park. She began working there after her Crest Hill Church closed, and she spent the past two years as store manager. Her best friend, Sandra, said that the 42-year-old was a hopeful, prayerful woman. Quote, because I know her so well, I think to the end, Rhoda might have even tried to talk to this man, tried to help him. Even with her last breath, I believe she would have been forgiving him and trying to help him. That's what gives me peace in all of this. Rhoda's passions were writing and helping others to find their passions. She started a program called Princess Unveiled a few years ago. It's a program to teach young girls etiquette and guide them to help them grow up to be young, productive women. She was survived by her mother, her father, three brothers, one sister, her maternal grandmother, aunts, uncles, nieces, nephews, cousins, and a fiance named Stuart Gibbs. Rhoda also did something very brave to try to save the lives of all these women. She found a way to call 911, and from what I understand, her head was probably likely covered up at this point. She somehow figured out where her phone was and dialed 911 could only get a few words to them, but that's what would get police there. And apparently, the police would arrive, unfortunately, a minute after the suspect left. But they would arrive very, very quickly because one of them was in the same shopping center, um, not in the exact same, that part of the strip, but there is a target kind of super center that's across the way from there. And that's the officer that would be the first to the scene. Unfortunately, it just wasn't in time. But let's hear a little of this 911 call. 911 emergency. Where at? Park. Stay on the line. Stay on the line. Let me get you to Tinley Park. Don't hang up. Now, that's a version that was released very early on to the press. Since police have actually released a longer version, I believe this might be the whole phone call. It's edited in a very strange way. Um, obviously there's pieces of it that have been redacted, but they haven't been cut together. So I don't know if this is the length that the phone call actually was, but, um, here we actually get to hear the suspect's voice a little bit as well. So let's take a listen to this. 911 emergency. Just a few fragments of a man's voice. You can hardly even make out what he's saying there. Some of the articles will give us a little bit of insight into some of the phrases they've been able to make out. But on top of the five women that are murdered during this, there is a sixth victim, someone that actually survives. Here at the Philadelphia Daily News from February 4th, 2008, Chicago papers say someone survived Lane Bryant robbery. As police continued their search yesterday for a gunman who killed five women at a suburban Chicago strip mall, Passersby erected a memorial of five white crosses and flowers to the victims. Police released few details about the Saturday shooting at the Lane Bryant clothing store. That's another big question with this. First of all, if, if robbery is the motive here, a Lane Bryant clothing store on a Saturday morning at 10 a.m., what are they going to have in terms of cash on hand at that point? I think most of us have worked retail and there's a few things that happen. The cash is controlled pretty strongly and usually moved off site very regularly. It might be done in a night drop. It might be the last manager on the way out, takes a bag and drops it into a special location at a local bank. 
It could be done sometimes with the morning shift, but basically the same thing. Before they open, the money is going to be taken out of the store, taken to a bank, and offloaded. Uh, or a pickup service would come by, a Brinks truck, something like that, and take the money from the location once again, more often than not outside of normal working hours. So 10 o'clock on a Saturday, 10 in the morning, how much cash are they going to have? Not much. Basically, based on what I'm seeing, about $200. The change that is left in the tills, just in case someone comes and pays for cash. But this was 2008. People were already very reliant on credit cards, maybe not like we are today. So there wasn't a lot of cash in this place. And it really makes you wonder, is that the motivation for this or is there something else at play? But we do have a survivor. And with a survivor, we hope for some detail that might be able to bring this thing to a close. Unfortunately, here we are 15 years later, it's still open, but the survivor does contribute some significant information to the case. Uh, investigators believed it was a robbery that was interrupted, but declined to say how it was stopped or who called 911. Obviously, we know the manager did call 911. Some articles I'm seeing are also alluding to the fact that that might have been what triggered him, that he became more upset when he re realized that there was a 911 call going on. Uh, other details I'm seeing, these women all pretty much killed execution style, uh, gunshot to the back of the head, except for Rhoda, the manager. Uh, she was shot in the front. So it does seem like maybe he, he did find out. Uh, how did the survivor survive? She actually was shot too, but it wounded her neck and she played dead. And somehow got through that. I, I don't know how you do that. I don't, how do you even try to hold your breath or something like when you're coping with a wound like that and try to convince someone else that, that you're not alive anymore. But thankfully, uh, this woman does do that. And at least gives us some information it takes police a while. They don't put out a composite sketch immediately. It's a very tender process that they go through with her. They're interviewing her several times. She has a lot of trauma from the stress of what she's been through. So they really take their time. I think it's a few weeks before a composite is actually released, but let's go ahead and continue with the articles. What else do we know about what happened in there? It was Saturday morning, February 2nd, 2008. The crime began to unfold shortly after 10 AM. And this is according to CNN.com. A man posing as a delivery man walked into the store. He chatted briefly with two customers and two employees. Then police said he pulled out a gun and announced a holdup. He forced the four women into the back room. He bound them with duct tape and placed them face down on the floor. Two more women who later entered the store were also taken to the back room, tied and placed next to the others. Store manager Rhoda McFarland managed to call 911 from her cell phone at 1044 AM. So this is going on for at least 40 minutes. Uh, just before she was shot to death. She got to her phone while the gunman was distracted, even though she was bound by duct tape as well. On the call, a man can be heard saying, I'm losing it. The six women were shot execution style. Five of them were dead by the time police arrived, but we do know that the sixth woman survived. And from this information at Southtown Star, the survivor was a 33-year-old part-time Lane Bryan employee who was shot in the neck but survived the shooting. She's provided police with a description of the gunman, and she is in protective custody. Obviously, she has never been named. She has been living with this, I assume, for the past 15 years, probably with some level of fear. Uh, if this was a simple robbery for some reason that turned into all this, it's clear that he was trying to cover up his tracks, and he missed that. he missed that goal. So... Um, would there be some reason why he might want to seek out the sixth victim in this? Possibly. So I, I certainly support that, you know, no one has ever released information about her, um, her personal whereabouts or even where she's from. I'm even being cautious just in terms, I found a little more detail. I'm just not going to put it out there. This is someone that needs to be protected in this case. And uh, someone that might be needed if this ever does get to trial in some form of prosecution. 
but she gave a description of the attacker. What is that? Is a medium complected black man, about five feet, nine inches tall, weighing 230 to 260 pounds. Now, for some reason, the height changes quite a bit on kind of the more current information. They're saying that he was probably six feet tall to six foot two, possibly. So we've got a big range in terms of height. Police have described him as pudgy. He was wearing his hair in cornrows with green beads and was clad in dark clothing. And very early on in this case, people are kind of wondering the same thing I was. Why did this guy pick this? Is there some other connectivity here? Is there something that he was sent there to do? It just doesn't seem like a very strong target, especially with the timing. One thing that is interesting about it is the location it's right at the end of the strip mall. There's nothing really around it at the time that this happens. There is a Best Buy, but it's way over here. Uh, the target that I mentioned is way over here. Uh, so, you know, I mean, if, if you're looking at this particular run of stores, well, we have a massage place. Uh, I don't know what this is. I can't quite make it out. It's, it's performance something. Um, you know, maybe if you're looking at this particular strip and thinking, Hey, I'm looking for a quick and easy hit. This one's right at the end. There's nothing around it. There's a highway that's literally right behind it. I could just jump on the highway and get out of here maybe, but to, for this to turn into multiple homicide scene over a $200, like just, it, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. And we have papers talking about that also. Did the killer know any of his victims? Most killers know their victims and detectives will have been working hard to establish any links over the past week, yet nothing linking the five murdered women or the sixth surviving witness to a potential suspect has emerged. The question is potentially central in the case because of the apparent strange choice of Lane Bryant as a robbery target. Honestly, uh, if he walked into a bank with a note that said this is a stick up he probably would have made off with at least seven eight times the amount of money that he got from this and, and not this it wouldn't have turned into a murder scene like it's just there's something about this where either his intent isn't being understood or maybe there was some kind of big emotional reaction to the fact that she had got her phone and and he thought that he had to try to cover up his tracks more i don't know why did the killer pick Lane Bryant? Lane Bryant was a soft target staffed by women with women shoppers in a relatively isolated part of Brookside Marketplace with no security cameras. That is really hurting this case. If they would have had some decent cameras in that store, uh, even just a camera on the door, maybe front and back door, that could have been extremely helpful in this case. There is a little footage but it's from the target across the way. So you can imagine it's not great. We'll, we'll get to that. Um, but that's all the footage that's been released so far. The store didn't have anything. The Best Buy, I think the angle is kind of wrong. I know Best Buy would certainly have cameras, especially with the amount of inventory they have and how much it's worth. I mean, electronics being so expensive. Uh, the store is kind of facing an off direction. I don't know that those cameras would have been particularly helpful for something that was going on over here. The killer apparently intended to continue robbing women as they arrived, according to police sources. It's just, it's a strange method. I really, I haven't heard of another, uh, another case of robbery like that, where someone would stay in a store and just what, you're just going to wait for people to keep coming in and then just take whatever's on them. I don't know, but a robber prepared to kill, especially an apparently well-prepared one who knew the layout of the store could easily have picked any number of other stores nearby that likely had more cash on hand at 10 a.m. on a Saturday morning. It is it is a super strange question with this case. So a few weeks later, we do have police. They go back and they keep searching the area. Apparently there's some type of water source like a pond or something that's behind the target. These guys literally get down on their hands and knees. It's it's iced over at this time, and they're literally searching for anything in that area. It sounds like they got a tip that maybe something was left back there or thrown back there. Uh, what's strange about that is thinking, well, if they had some footage, we know that they have some footage from Target. It's basically just a vehicle that they think the suspect was in. If that vehicle got closer to the target for him to ditch something behind it, you'd think they'd have better footage of that vehicle and maybe would have released that because the footage they do have, this is it. 
And you can see this is from America's Most Wanted. And I believe this is footage that was actually enhanced. Uh, they sent it off to NASA from what I read to get it enhanced. And what are they trying to get you to notice? Right in the middle of this, there's a dark colored SUV. And that's they've got a handful of these photos. This is the best one. The other ones are, are basically, you can't tell. It's just a bunch of black squares. This is the best thing they had. So it just it occurs to me that if this vehicle got anywhere near that target, they would have had some other footage of it. And why would America's Most Wanted be relying on this that is extremely zoomed in from a location that is hundreds of yards away uh, is, is what it look like, looks like based on the map here. I mean, it's, it's nowhere near it. So this article does mention that they went looking through that retention pond, but they're also back out there. They're just rechecking the area, looking for anything they could find to help them with this case. And of course, if they're doing that, you know, the perception is they're having some issues with this case. Uh, if they're literally on their hands and knees crawling around a retention pond trying to find something and then going back a number of days later searching again, uh, either they have a tip that keeps drawing them to that area or they really need some help. And here we are 15 years later and it's, it's pretty obvious they need help with this case. Chicago Tribune, the 14th of February, 2008. Officials question man in five slayings. They do get someone on their radar, basically someone that resembles the sketch that was put out. Uh, we did see a little bit of the sketch here in this video segment. And basically, they have someone that has an arrest warrant that looks like that sketch. They decide that they're going to question this man. I don't see any other updates on this. I don't think anything came out of that, unfortunately. A little over a month after this occurs, they do release the SUV photos. Uh, this article is saying that there's actually 10 of those photos. I think I've seen five or six of them. But like I mentioned, I've, I've showed you guys the best one. This is by far the best of, of all of them. Um, not particularly helpful. Obviously, you're not going to get plate information or anything like that. Once again, I'm just curious, and it's tough with a case like this because I do think law enforcement has more and they're being very, very tight-lipped about it. If this person does try to leave this area, aren't they going to be driving closer to either that target or the Best Buy? So just looking at the layout of the roads into and out of this shopping center, which has been really built up over the past several years, I don't think many of these buildings are not there at this time. But we know Best Buy is effectively on one side. He's probably not going to drive over there. There's no outlet there to get him to the freeways. Marketplace Drive is the main way in and out, and that takes you by the target. There is another side entrance, once again, takes you by the target. So I'm really surprised that there isn't some form of better picture with the vehicle in particular. Maybe not solid enough that you'd be able to get the license plate on it, but there's got to be a better photo than this. I mean, look at all this distance. The car's parked here somewhere, and that's what they picked up from the front of the target camera. When he left, he had to go by there, unless there was some other road that uh, was there at the time that has since been removed. But on top of that, look where this thing is located. I mean, he's right onto a highway interchange, and he can go off in any direction, north, south, east, west. About six months after the murders, the Chicagoist puts out this article talking about two different theories that police are pursuing at this time. One is that the quintuple murder may be linked to the Chatham murders in which five people were also killed and police have made arrests. I haven't dived into that case a whole lot, but effectively they have their suspect in that case. If it was related to that case, I think this thing would be closed by now. Uh, the other theory has sent police to Texas to investigate possible financial wrongdoings within a defunct church where store manager Rhoda McFarlane had been an associate pastor. So there's some type of connectivity with the church that she used to work for and Texas. According to the Chicago Tribune, quote, the fact that investigators are aggressively pursuing the church angle signals that they are looking at scenarios far different from the botched robbery theory authorities have publicly discussed. But the Sun-Times says investigators are looking to compare DNA evidence from the thus far unlinked crimes and sources told the Sun-Times that the Texas probe isn't likely to lead to a major break in the case. 
Here we are years later. Obviously, it did not lead to a major break, but there is one other aspect of this Texas connection that I do think is interesting, noted here in the Journal and Courier in August of 2008. Commander Tom Weatherold of the Illinois State Police told the Tribune that authorities were also investigating a 20-minute phone call placed by a former member of the church about an hour before the killings took place. Why would that phone call be interesting? It was routed through a cell tower near the Lane Bryant in Tinley Park. That is pretty compelling. Uh, and is that still part of the case or not? We don't know. They're just remaining too tight-lipped on this. This this might be a main lead in this case, or maybe they spoke to the person, they figured out that there was nothing to this phone call. It just happened to be a coincidence. Kind of a strong coincidence in my mind, just thinking that you've got a phone call routed to a cell tower that is near that area where an hour later, someone related to a business that ties back to that Texas area is murdered which would kind of make Rhoda probably the intended target if that's what we're talking about here. But then why spend so much time? Why is he in there for 40 minutes? Why is he waiting for other people to show up? At any point, that could have gone wrong. Someone could have started heading towards the store, saw something weird was going on in there, turned around and called the police, and he would have been busted. 40 minutes is a lot of time. It's, it's just not making a lot of sense. It's even a lot of time just for a robbery situation, unless you run with that assumption that we kind of heard in the early press that he, he was thinking about staying there and robbing people as they came in. An article from the Daily Mail talks about this case five years after the fact. At that point, authorities had received 6,700 tips, but are no closer to knowing who took the women's lives or why. Uh, there is a new composite that is released. We can see here that is including a, a bit more of the description that we heard about. We can see the the green beads are on his hair. It is done in cornrows. Uh, it's a bit of a better image, I think, than the first one. Uh, three investigators work on the case full time and tips keep coming in, though they're becoming less frequent. In 2008, there were 5,600. Uh, they're saying last year, so that would have been 2012 there were only 87 tips that came in related to this case, which is still quite a bit, you would think, in terms of keeping it active and still giving law enforcement something to work with. Investigators have followed leads as far afield as Texas, North Carolina, and London, but nothing has helped solve the crime and there were no security cameras in the store to assist police. That even starts a conversation within Tinley Park where they think about enacting like a citywide law where businesses have to have some form of camera in them. I didn't see how that shook out. I don't know that you can really kind of require businesses to do something like that. But for any retail establishment where you're, there's potential for handling cash, you would think that, that that probably should be part of it. With specialist training courses and help from agencies, including NASA, the police department in Tinley has spent nearly $2 million trying to find the killer. Other potential involvement from NASA, I heard from one of the family members, it sounds like they did review some form of satellite photography, but once again, you're talking about images that once you zoom in on those things, you're looking at blocks. So the thing that's interesting about satellite is thinking about the possibility that they might've picked up the vehicle, but we're not talking about the same, it's not like video footage, like some of those images might be captured once every minute or something along those lines. Like, can you really track a vehicle that's moving? It might be far less. I'm not sure for satellite images in particular. Um, obviously, it, it didn't give them the break that they've been looking for. Here's an update from also from 2013. So still the five year mark. For the first time since five women were killed at the Lane Bryant and Tinley Park, a retail store will open for business tomorrow morning on the same site. TJ Maxx is opening in the same space. So it took five years, basically. Uh, no one would occupy that building. They came in and they renovated the face of the building pretty significantly. And you can see uh, other things have kind of grown into this shopping center. There's other buildings that have been added to the left of it. Now you can see the Best Buy is kind of separated by this Ross dress for less. But they basically, they just redid the whole front of this Um I think because it was just so known in that community about what had happened there. 
Mayor Ed Zabroki said it's bittersweet, a bitter thing in the sense that it represents a tragedy that occurred five and a half years ago, and it's a stain on our community. TJ Maxx also issued a statement saying, we certainly understand the many sensitivities regarding this location, and we respectfully look forward to supporting the community as a good neighbor. They also donated $10,000 to a Tinley Park-based charity called Together We Cope in honor of the victims. The mayor said he's still optimistic that the man who killed the five women will be caught. And in this case where it looks like they're trying to bring on all the help they can get, I mean, they're reaching out to NASA to help them with footage. They also reach out to an organization we've talked about a few times on Case Cracked. Tinley Park Police get help from Crime Solving Group. The Vidoc Society in Philadelphia is a group of the top criminal and forensic investigators who focus on reviewing unsolved homicide cases. This is an organization that basically gets together, gets access to case information, and then they kind of reprocess it. It's a way to get fresh eyes, a fresh perspective, and very experienced perspective to these cases. So thankfully, they get involved here as well. We have a comment from Tinley Park Police Chief Steve Neubauer. He says, members of this group are some of the finest criminalists in the country. That's it for this article. What happens with that analysis? I did see a comment from an investigator working on this case that said, basically, Vidoc, they did their review of the case. They basically confirmed that the approach that law enforcement had taken with their investigative steps was good and gave them a few ideas about other things that they could do. Unfortunately, Vidoc is not in a position and it's not what they do. They don't like take a case over and then start running it for themselves. They're really like an advisory council. So they did give some ideas for next steps basically back to the local police department. Tinley Park Police release new composite. And here is the latest of the composites. This one from February, 2018. Uh, I'm not sure this one and all the images that I've seen of it are a little funky. Like they've been kind of sloppily cropped out here and I don't know why. Uh, also the coloring on the bead has been removed, but, um, that is the official composite that's been released in 2018. The new image was created by Michigan state police based on original sketches made from an eyewitness account in 2008 and utilizes the latest in facial identification technology to provide a more lifelike representation of the suspect, according to a statement from the Tinley Police Department. We hope this enhanced version will lead to the identification of the suspect in this horrible crime, said Police Chief Steve Neubauer in the statement. The suspect, so here's kind of the latest of the descriptions, and it's a much deeper, more detailed description. The suspect was described as a man with a medium to dark skin tone between six feet and six foot two with broad shoulders and a husky build. At the time of the shooting, he appeared to be between 25 and 35 years old, meaning that he would be, they're saying 35 to 45 today. I guess now we could push that up another five years. So he'd be somewhere between 40 and 50 now. At the time of the murders, he wore braided hair with three to five puffy cornrows pulled toward the back of his head. One braid hung down his right cheek with four light green beads on the end. He was wearing a dark colored waist length jacket and black jeans with embroidery similar to a cursive letter G on the back pockets. He also wore a charcoal gray ski cap or skull cap. So maybe that's why they're trying to close in uh, the detail on his hair in this image a little bit. Um, but I'm kind of curious. I mean, this just, I don't know, the crop job on this, they've they have knocked out, you know, three of the beads, the color has been removed. It's weird to say that we're releasing something more photorealistic, but then kind of having the image cropped in this way where it's, it's damaging the integrity of the photo a bit. I mean, for the facial reconstruction, I think this is a lot better than, you know, this, this initial drawing for sure. Um, Hopefully it will be helpful. You never know when an image like that's going to get in front of the right person and trigger that memory. At the 10 year mark, we have the lead detective on the case be interviewed at the Chicago Tribune. We're missing one piece. A decade later, the deaths of five women killed in Lane Bryant's store remain unsolved. And this is Detective Ray Violetto that's been working the case. 
Violetto said that for the last three years, the department has averaged a bit more than a tip a week in the case, and that each lead and tip gets evaluated. Some that on the surface appear very promising don't produce the hoped for result, he said. He said he has been the department's lead investigator on the case since roughly August of 2008. In the years since the shootings, Tinley Park Police have received help in the case from law enforcement agencies, including the Illinois State Police, South Suburban Major Crimes Task Force, FBI, Secret Service, as well as NASA. Still standing and unclaimed is a $100,000 reward. I believe that is actually still currently active. Much of it put up by the parent company of Lane Bryant. The company also established a memorial fund to provide financial assistance to the women's families. I saw they were also holding uh, basically sales where all the proceeds from those sales were going to help these families as well. I'm just I'm thankful that the company would stand behind them like this. That missing piece police need will come from someone who has inside knowledge of the crime or the offender, Violetto said. There are individuals out there who know who committed this crime. If you happen to be watching this, we have all the contact information you need in the description box down below. You can remain anonymous and you can claim that reward. Uh, there's even some clarification we're going to get to at the end of this. It's not just a reward that is based on a conviction. They're looking to, if, if you point them in the right direction, they want to give you that money. So uh, we'll, we'll get to that at the end here. But let's continue with a few more articles. This one from 2018, five women killed in 2008, Lane Bryant slayings remembered at prayer service. So at the 10 year, we do have the families get back together at a prayer service to remember their lost loved ones. Maurice Hamilton, whose sister Rhoda McFarlane was manager of the store and among those killed, said the families of the women have bonded in their grief to support one another and that the support of others is a blessing, referring to the people who attended that prayer service. I can smile today, he said. Hamilton said that although the killer of his sister and the other four women has yet to be brought to justice, we've got faith in the police department. About 200 people were in the church for the service. In front of the altar were pictures of the five women with five white candles in front of them. And we do have a change of guard. The police chief that's been talking about this the whole time seems like he retires. The mayor, that gets changed out. Even the lead investigator. As of 2022, Tinley Park brings fresh eyes to Lane Bryant killings. They're dedicating new resources to solving the crime. We've never given up on this case, said now Mayor Michael Glotz. Every year, we make sure the police department has the resources they need to continue their investigation. We won't rest until the killer is brought to justice and the family of those five innocent women have the closure they deserve. Tinley Park Police Chief, new police chief, Matt Walsh, told Patch, two new detectives were assigned to take over the case. According to officials, police are still receiving tips associated with the killings. In 2020 alone, over 50 tips came in to the Tinley Park hotline, so it sounds like it's been relatively constant. Like they had thousands that came in for the first few years that kind of went down a bit, but for the past five, 10 years, it seems like it's been at least a tip a week that is getting called in due to the retirement of our lead investigator and the promotion of another. We decided now was the perfect time to bring in a fresh set of eyes to review the evidence said deputy chief Lawrence Rafferty in a press release. The young officers we've assigned to this case have been doing an outstanding job so far, going back over hundreds of old leads and following up on new ones as they come in. Local police, company officials, and South Suburban Major Crimes Task Force are still offering a $100,000 reward for information that could lead to an arrest. And in 2023, as the 15-year mark comes up, a few new theories are discussed here at Fox 32. Let's touch on those real quick. It's now been 15 years. The killer has still not been caught. I'm hoping there was some sort of physical evidence left behind at the crime scene, said retired FBI Special Agent Ross Rice. The problem with physical evidence, and you just saw that with the murder of four college students in Idaho, you can find physical evidence at a crime scene, whether it's a latent fingerprint or DNA, but you have to have a known sample to compare it to. Since this case is still an open investigation for Tinley Park Police, we don't know all the evidence that was collected at the crime scene. 
The one thing that screams out to me when hearing that quote is, yes, you still need a known sample to compare it to, but the genetic genealogy, the size of that known sample has now grown exponentially. Basically, if it's the odds of did someone ever put DNA into a database looking for uh, related family members on a website like MyHeritage or, or one of those. Um, that that aspect for DNA in particular is completely different than it used to be. You know, it used to be, well, yeah, we've got DNA, but now we need the suspect's DNA and we do a one-to-one -one comparison. Ultimately, that's where the genealogy ends up, but now they've got a major pointer in terms of, hey, we can take that DNA profile, run it through GEDmatch, try to start putting together the family structure around that DNA and possibly that'll point us towards a suspect who then they usually follow around, wait for him to dispose of something that has their saliva on it, and boom, there's their one-to-one -one comparison match. I still believe the offender is likely dead, and that's why that connection hasn't been made, said Mark Buslick, a retired Chicago police commander. It did occur to me also that maybe this person isn't alive anymore. Maybe that's why they're having some issue with this. In addition to being deceased, Buslick said that the suspect may have left the Chicago area immediately following the crime. I think that's a distinct possibility. It's very close to the highway. It would be very easy to leave. Now, if he was living in the area and then going through that, do I think that he would have just jumped on the highway and like fled the state and just left everything behind? Maybe, but it doesn't seem like a strong possibility. The other aspect he's touching on here has a, a little more merit to it. Uh, because it was such an odd target for a robbery, I think that's a possibility that it was very much a random target and that the offender may have been passing through and then continued on his way. Now that is interesting in particular, once again, just because of, of looking at the location of that shopping center with the highway structure. Um, could that have been someone that was just passing through this area? Certainly. Why would Lane Bryant have called out to them in particular? I don't know, but you could take one of these exits. It would be the first shopping center you saw. Um, Target is a huge store. You know, it's got dozens of employees in there at any particular time. Same thing for Best Buy. Of all the retail spots here, for looking for a situation that you could control, maybe that was the choice. But for what? Like, are we talking this guy was running out of gas money? Like, it's still the amount of money is very, very troubling to me. Even with this idea that he was going to stay in there and just wait for people to come in and then take whatever they had on them. How long is that going to be? And how much are you going to get from that? It's And the risk of just being there for that much time, just none of it makes a lot of sense. It really doesn't. On the flip side, I'm kind of, I'm kind of hoping that there's more connectivity because I think that would help the investigation if there was actually someone that was an intended target. But even on that side, I'm struggling with it because 40 minutes, that's a long time. That's a lot of time to be spending there. What are you doing in that time? The only other potential reason for this that I've run into, and I've only seen it referred to in two articles, uh, it, it does note that he groped one of the women for a period of time. And I'm only bringing that up because there had to be other motivations, other things that were driving this person. Was that, was, was it, was he a stalker of one of these women? Something along those lines. Is there, is there some other connectivity here that makes sense for the amount of time that he's spending there? Maybe. And it could be that police have those details to actually support that. And they're just not putting that out there because they're afraid that it would tilt the public perception too hard in, in one particular way or ruin their chances at getting a successful conviction later. I don't, I don't know. Um, but trying to understand, I mean, I guess it's the same question that I've been wrestling with for years at this point. How do you understand why a criminal does what a criminal does? At the website for the village of Tinley Park, they have a page dedicated to this case. They've got the current composite. They have a link to the wanted poster down here and some additional details on that reward that show that they're they're treating this case a bit differently. They're They're really looking to bring this man in. The public is reminded that the offender remains at large and should be considered armed and dangerous. 
A $100,000 reward has been established for information leading to the arrest of the offender. The reward is not dependent upon conviction. Any information will be kept confidential. I don't think I've ever seen that phrasing before. So basically, it sounds like if you have enough information to get this guy arrested, you're going to be eligible and get the reward at that point. They're not going to, you know, kind of make it dependent on does this get through a court process and does the judge and jury see it the same way that we do. Um, pretty rare. I don't think I've ever actually seen that happen before. But these ladies deserve justice. And keep in mind, there's a sixth victim out there that has to live with the reality that this man is running free and has been for 15 years. That's terrifying. If you have information on this case, please, please do the right thing. Please call it in using the details that we have in the description box down below. And if you have any friends that live in the Chicago area, please share this video with them. Let's keep the exposure raised on this. Thankfully, it seems like it's had a pretty good pulse of tips, but they're still waiting for that one. And maybe you sharing this video is going to help that one tip come in. So I appreciate it if you just take a few moments and think, do I know anyone that I can share this with? A big thank you to everyone that supports our work here on the Lord and Arch channel. We always run limited commercials for you guys, the viewers, but also for the families of these victims that we're trying to help. We don't want you to hit a seven minute ad in the middle of this presentation and then leave and miss the important information that comes after it. So we can't do that without support. If you want to help support the channel, please visit lordandarts.com. There you can sign up for Patreon, sign up for PayPal, buy merchandise, or even just buy us a coffee like Candy Bishop recently did. We really appreciate your guys' help as we look to help as many families as we can here on the channel. I also want to thank some new patrons. A big thank you to Naders71 is back on Patreon. Thank you, Naders. Claire Dalton and Rochelle H., thank you for joining on Patreon as well. Take care, everyone. Have a nice weekend. Thank you so much for joining us here today. And we'll see you again on Monday with a brand new episode of Case Cracked right here on the Lord March channel.